Welcome back for season four of Talking Guitar, brought to you by the Carter Vintage Exchange and the North American Guitar in Nashville, Tennessee. Lindsay here, and I'm excited to kick off this new season with luthier Michel Aboudib. Still fresh off his Samaji apprenticeship and back in the workshop in Toulouse, France, Michel told me all about his expansive, multidisciplinary background and how it led him to craft guitars that really draw you in on every sensory level. Tone appreciation gets compared to wine tasting, and we discuss the important influences of fellow luthiers Jeff Traugott and Chris Morimoto, and the valuable musical friendship that he has with guitarist Antoine Abri, heard here playing his Moon Trout Mod D. Please enjoy my chat with Michel Aboudib of Aboudib Guitars. In Toulouse, I was I was looking for a shop. I wanted to do this uh, temporarily. The, the, what I'm going to say is, is will give you a little, basically my introduction to the guitar world mm-hmm. as a maker. <laughs> I had made the guitar before as a hobby. I had a couple orders from, you know, cousins who wanted to help out. One of them doesn't even play. Just <laughs> uh, so when I went to Toulouse, uh, I needed a shop because I had these couple orders to finish. And the following year, there was going to be a show in Paris. That was a good time frame for me to be like, oh, okay, I can aim for that, make a few guitars and see where it all goes. I was able to make a couple of guitars for the show and then the show was canceled. Oh no. Um, yeah, so when it was canceled, I was like, okay, should I, you know, the, it was canceled because of COVID, but I also, I was wondering still if I should be doing this full time or if I was still like between different things. So during the lockdown, I was doing, studying other things and still working on the guitar that I had. I couldn't go to the shop because it was a, I found a shared shop in Toulouse, mm-hmm. but I couldn't go there because it's shared shop and nobody knew anything about COVID. So everybody was like, hey, you know what? We're closing the shop. Nobody's going. Yeah. Just, so I had a guitar at home. I was doing French polish on it. And I just did that for like a month, French polish <laughs> on a guitar. Yeah. So by the end of that lockdown, I had one more order. And then a few more orders that just came in slowly. And I was like, okay, so I really should be focusing on this and no more trying to do other things. Do you think you still would have gone into guitar building if you had stayed in the U.S. for any reason? I think I think I would have. Because uh, I was already, you know, making guitars and I really wanted to do that. But because there was, um, you know, it was uncertain. I didn't have steady orders. Yeah. Uh, I had mostly, you know, it was friends and family at first and a few orders here and there but it, it wasn't enough to to be a job mm-hmm. <laughs> full-time I mean it was full-time but it wasn't enough to know what, what's going to happen in six months right. or a year the thing that that I find really interesting about getting started with something like guitar making is it seems like you need so much in terms of like tools and space and so it doesn't seem like something that would be easy to get into for everybody so do you, I mean have you always just had like kind of the I guess, yeah, the tools and the space to just tackle some projects here and there? Uh, no, not really. Mm-hmm. Um, actually, my first guitar I made with only hand tools. I mean, and and, and limited number of hand tools. <laughs> I had uh, two hand planes, you know, a, you know, one that's about, I don't know, eight, 10 inches and a small block plane and uh, maybe two or three chisels. Yeah, my first guitar was made in in a bedroom, <laughs> an extra bedroom we had <laughs> in the house, and uh, with just hand tools. And I I made the bench because I didn't have a bench. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, it was. I mean, I, it was. It's still. I still have that guitar. It's. I think it's a very good guitar. It was a flamenco. Cool. And uh, I had the professional flamenco players in the DC area play it and. Uh, there's a there's a, one of them who you know kept asking me to bring it to his shows and restaurants and stuff. So he would play half of his set on it. So oh, you know, cool. and he's a, yeah, he's a good player and he's very well well known in the area. So I was like, oh, that's that's very nice. It's encouraging for a first guitar, and you can make a good guitar with mm-hmm. with any tools. But once you're in production and you have deadlines and clients waiting, and it's better to have more tools, shop space, so you can be organized. Yeah. Yeah. That's for later. But to get started, to get started, you can get started with very, very little. 
Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's cool to know. The thing that I always wonder for folks who, who are able to dive into that so, so well. So, and it kind of sounds like from your childhood, like you did have some exposure to like working with tools and, and being handy and, and making things so that you kind of had that experience prior to coming to guitar. Yeah, in a way I, I, I did because I was just surrounded by people who did a lot of things, whether with their hands or mm -hmm. with their just writing a lot of it's kind of like half intellectual, but also my uncles and my dad, they always did all the repairs in the house by themselves. My uncle did all the electricity and plumbing. It's just my dad did too. And it's just mm -hmm. things they're used to do. It's kind of, it's big family with very rich environment. Very, very. My dad is, um, worked a lot in orthopedic surgery. It's like, it's basically fixing and building things. <laughs> yeah. <it's> all <laughs> drilling Just and people. All that. Yeah. Well, usually people, but then you apply the same techniques to making furniture, which he yeah. made a lot of our furniture because on weekends he liked to do this kind of stuff. So I just watch him do these things and yeah. sometimes that would help a little bit. Yeah. I hadn't built like a lot of skills, but I knew it was possible. So once you know something is, you, you know, you can do it because you've seen that many people around you do it. You're like, oh, yeah, it's right. probably easy. And then <laughs> it's good that you don't realize how difficult it actually is. <laughs> it's good that you don't realize because you're like, you jump into it and then then by the time you, you realize it's very difficult, well, in, you're already in it. So it, yeah, not a, it's a good idea to get. Yeah, exactly. I feel yeah. like for folks like I, like I didn't grow up with that many people actually like making things. And so to me, the idea of making something, I'm like, what? No, the machines do that. <laughs> so it's nice to have <laughs> exposure. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. yeah, that's really cool. So I was interested to see that you also um, kind of like Mark Gallero, you have a film background, which is, I mean, that's I do. not super common, I guess, yeah. among, among luthiers. Well, yeah. In college, I started, um, I studied well, barely studied science at first. I was very interested in science. I just, I loved the science, but the environment wasn't appealing. It, was, mm -hmm. uh, it felt like high school again, and I didn't want to be in high school anymore. <laughs> so I studied literature. And, and after literature, I went into animation, which I did 3D animation. I did that for a year, which cool. it was a one year school. Uh, and it was a bad timing because at that time there was a recession in France. And so all the studios who were hiring, well, taking um, uh, interns that year were like, we can't, we don't have oh. the budget for an intern. We can't, yeah. we don't even have work for you because we don't have work. Like, oh, yeah. That's too bad that the year I do that. It, <laughs> but anyway, so I was, then I thought about it and I thought I would, okay, so this is animation. It, it's part of film. You know, maybe it's a good idea to continue studying and study film, like, mm -hmm. you know, the actual thing. <laughs> so I looked into studying film and I applied for a few schools and I was accepted in Montreal and in San Francisco. And uh, well, you know, the choice wasn't too difficult. <laughs> I decided to go to San Francisco and that's what brought <laughs> me to the US first and to film school. And then I finished film school with uh, the Sorbonne in Paris because the US school was too expensive. <laughs> so I finished. I, I lived in the U.S., but I did. Um, I studied in France, and I went there to take the exam. Okay. And then, yeah. So it was a, it was less hands-on, but it was very good uh, in terms of film analysis and film history and all that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And then I <clears throat> I worked in film for a few years as a director of photography. Wow. Um, yeah, mostly it was mostly on short films because I I lived in D.C. and uh, we wanted to move to LA, but we never really made it happen. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. so I worked on whatever was available in DC. It was a lot of documentaries. I didn't really want to work in documentary, mm -hmm. so I did a lot of short films and a few a few features. Well, along the way, um, so I guess my other question that I always like to know or that I like to ask is about your musical background. So, did you? ever play music like professionally on any level or just amateur just for fun I was gonna say no but I did I did play professionally a little very okay. little bit um I I played the guitar since I was a kid mm -hmm. I not not very seriously but just I had an uncle who showed me and my cousins a lot of things the, he was he was an 
really, really good musician. He played the guitar and the oud. Mm. And the oud, he, he was actually the one who taught a lot of the oud players. Oh, wow. In that town in Syria. Like, he's very well known in, uh, for that. Uh, and anyway, so the guitar, I was, I, don't know, I was tiny. I don't even remember how old I was. Probably very small and the guitar was very big. And he was just <laughs> teaching me and my cousins who would come over for the summer vacation. He would, you know, very simple things on the guitar. And that was my first introduction to the guitar. My dad played the guitar also. And uh, there was always music around. Mm -hmm. you know. Later, I played, I, yeah, I tried, I took guitar lessons, but it was never for a long time. And I never was very serious about it. <laughs> uh, but then, you know, it, it was always there. I would always, from time to time, pick up the guitar and play a little. Mm -hmm. uh, until college, where I, I was more serious about it and learned flamenco. Mm. And uh, I didn't play flamenco professionally, but in a way, a little bit, because I, I, I was in a band that was kind of a fusion band. I was, actually, it was a North African, it was a Rai band. So, I, <laughs> But we incorporated other things in it. So there, were, <clears throat> there was a little bit of uh, flamenco influence in some mm -hmm. pieces. So I played the guitar on those. Um, so that's the only time I played professionally. There was okay. that band and I, a couple other bands where I, I played a few shows with uh, around that time, around the early 2000s. I played the drums for a long time. I took drums lessons for like six years and I played uh, mostly jazz. Yeah, that, cool. that was all around the same. Yeah. 2000, 2000 something. And before film school, once I was in film school, I, I, I played a lot less after that. Do you feel like your your musical background influences your choice and choices in guitar making at all, or do you find yourself guided with your with your own guitars that you make, kind of by other by other like the playing of other people or like your clients or influences that you picked up since you started building? What what do you feel like kind of drives you the most? Um, I think there was, to some extent, there was a little bit of influence because of the flamenco and classical guitar background. Mm -hmm. But that's really on the, like, the technical aspect, because the first few guitars I made were flamenco and classical. So when I moved on to steel string, well, I, I used some of the same methods. Um, but other than that, I feel like the overall influence on design and my approach to what, you know, what I'm looking for in terms of sound, I don't think music is more had more influence than anything else in my life. I mean, it's influenced me because what I listen to influences me just mm -hmm. like you know um what i see when i where i go for walks or you know, all mm -hmm. the things that have that make up your life and your experience but not music more it's hard to know what influences me but the things i look for when i try to describe a sound that i like if i hear a sound i like or a guitar I, you know that like a lot most of the time it's not it's i can't describe it in terms of sound or musicality or something like this. Uh, I don't relate it to kinds of music or, oh, this makes me feel like you could play this on it. But more, mm -hmm. it's more like uh, either visual scenes mm -hmm. so, or textures that usually like fabric textures or food, mm -hmm. food flavors and textures and aromas. And for some reason, these translate sound to me. <laughs> so. Uh, I think I mentioned to you that uh, I find that buttery aspect. In, yeah, you mentioned uh, that Jeff word, and I was like, that's Trogat kind of a good word for guitar. guitar. <laughs> it's a, yeah, it's strange. I can't explain it any other way. And I feel like if you have one of Jeff's guitars in your hands, or if you hear it in front of you, you will, you will understand. If I say buttery, yeah. you're like, oh, yeah, yeah, I understand why you say buttery. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's not any of the other descriptors of you know softness and like the the soft or sweet aspect of the sound. Mm -hmm. There are other descriptors like uh, silky or velvety or creamy or any of these or sweet. Mm -hmm. and none of them apply except buttery <laughs> for Jeff's guitar. <laughs> yeah, and and this is something like when the first time I heard, I was like, this is this is amazing. This is exactly what I love in the sound of the guitar. Mm -hmm. And then I heard it again. I heard he sent me a video which recorded on the phone of one of his um, musicians, one of his clients. 
it was a 12 string, so very different from what I heard before. And the guy was, you know, going at it and playing pretty loud and, and singing and all that. And despite the all that, you could still hear the buttery sound. So it's not just mm -hmm. how it's played, it's really there in the guitar somehow. Uh, yeah. It, his guitars have that. <laughs> So anyway, just to say what influence, I don't know if it's an influence or um, I don't know why there's this connection with certain mm -hmm. foods with certain textures uh, and scenes, um, visual scenes. Sometimes there, there's a guitar I made a few years ago and I was trying to describe it. And all I could come up with is like, it remind, it makes me feel like I'm, uh, you know, sipping a hot chocolate by the fireplace when it's snowing mm -hmm. outside. That's that's what this guitar sounds like to yeah. me. I don't know. It's not. It's really this what first thing I think of, mm -hmm. and that's how I can describe the feel of a guitar. Usually, that it's yeah. more. It's not really sounds. It's very. Really it's almost, yeah. It's almost more of like a synesthetic experience where it's yeah. It's not just that one <clears throat> sense. You're you're kind of perceiving it and processing it through like all five senses, yeah. depending on the guitar. Maybe some guitars don't have like a buttery or like salty essence to them but another one might so i feel like because you have that background that you do with um with film and which we haven't discussed yet but with your sommelier background like it makes so much sense that you kind of perceive things in that very multi-dimensional way oh uh, yeah it's it's probably true yeah i mean <laughs> I, I i agree it, it definitely has to to do with that because when you when you study these things you train your senses Mm -hmm. and you train you know i i wasn't it, it, some people we're all born with different abilities and some in you know some are born with a better sense of smell or whatever but the, the innate part isn't really uh, it's important because it can help you but it's not really that important because you can train all your senses right. and when you study film well you train your eyes you train when you, you know, when you're a director of photography you you know, you look at a room, you need to light it, you need to imagine where people are standing, how the light comes in, etc. When you when you study, um, you know, art or art history, you need to, you, you study all these things, like lighting, you study lighting, and when you study art. Mm -hmm. And when you're sommelier, well, you train, you train your nose, but you really train it, you don't, the first, I, you know, when I, when I started in the wine business, I just, I would smell a wine, I would no idea what's going on i would taste yeah. it and the only thing i could say it's it, it's a it's a red wine but that's because i saw it's red you know? I, I couldn't taste it and say it's a red wine even now sometimes between red and white it's hard but but um but after training for for a few years you know you're able to distinguish a lot of aromas and flavors and mm -hmm. because you know you start with simple things you, at first in red wines you look for fruit is it a black fruit or a red fruit for mm -hmm. a while you're just looking for these two things and eventually you start you know coming up with all these things that come to your mind and, and some of it is some of that is very cinematic too so it links to other things you you've lived and that actually the link between aroma and and visual scenes that's for everybody you don't need to study film for that like anybody yeah. can smell something and immediately be transported to oh at my grandparents' house in the attic, there was this day the light was coming that way, and it smelled like this. Yeah. Oh well, yeah, you just you just smelled something that smells like old furniture. And it reminds me of that time, that particular time. This is this is a universal. Yeah. 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 But so yeah, it, it definitely there is some link to what I've done before. Um, but also there is. I always thought that um, the, making guitars and listening to them uh, and like having the guitar experience is multi-sensory. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, at, you know, when you when you get started, you're like, oh, I only care about the sound, and I want to make guitars that sound good. I don't care what they look like, but this is we all know this, this is not true. I mean, some for some people maybe it is, but for for me it's not. I mm -hmm. I tried going along those lines at first I was like I don't really believe that what I believe is when you open a case you see a guitar there are two things that happen is you see the guitar and you smell it <laughs> immediately when you open the case and you know it's a very different experience if it's a very you know 
plain, not in the bad, not, nothing bad in being plain, but it's like it's very clean looking with a simple wood rosette and it smells like a clean look or maybe a little bit like lacquer, but not in an annoying way. That's a very different experience from opening something. It has like, it's very decorated or very bright colors or that smells like pine or it smells like if if you've opened a guitar, that's you know, a flamenco guitar made with uh, cypress back and sides, this will smell like cypress for a billion years. Like you can really? nitro anything on it. It just smells like cypress. <laughs> and so that's my first guitar. I made it many, many years ago and it's still, now I opened the case and it smells like cypress. And I used resins on there that have, at the time had a stronger smell, uh, like uh, gum Benjamin that smells like vanilla. And you know, it smelled like vanilla for a year or two. And then the vanilla smell went away and the cypress is still there. <laughs> so just to say that smell is, you know, it, it's part of the experience. And, yeah, definitely. And then, of, you know, when and you touch the guitar, when you play it, it vibrates, uh, you know, your whole body feels it. You know? mm -hmm. uh, so all our senses, except, you know, we usually tend not to lick guitars to <laughs> taste them. But, well, you don't, but. But, you know, let's just say that, <laughs> oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, I guess we could. Some some of the resins used in, uh, when I do French polish, sometimes I just use shellac, sometimes I use other resins. And you can, technically, you could eat the finish. Oh, really? It's completely <laughs> edible. Yeah, oh. and a lot of them are used, actually, in in uh, making, in, in food. And, oh, okay. Yeah, well, I guess that makes in sense. foods and uh, pastry. <laughs> Um, but anyway, the, the joke aside, that, um, <laughs> yeah, it's important to me to, no, to notice. I, I noticed a few years ago that it's a, it's a multi-sensory experience to mm -hmm. experience the guitar and play it. And uh, it is also when you make the guitar, because uh, all, all your senses are involved in making it. Yeah. Well, and so you mentioned studying math. Do you feel like your 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 experience with that also affects your your guitar making i mean because that seems like a really obvious thing that would but um but I, I also feel like not every luthier is necessarily thinking about things in that kind of like more rigorous scientific way there may be more like kind of feeling it out so i'm, I'm curious to hear where you are on that sort of science to art spectrum <laughs> yeah it's uh, well it's funny because what comes from math in my approach to guitar making has nothing to do with how rigorous Mm -hmm. uh, that's that would be more my interest in engineering and you know math is definitely involved in there but but I think what I take from math is uh, the ability to think abstractly kind of synthesize uh, concepts and realize that it you know it's not that particular detail that matters it's how it fits in the whole system yeah, just being able to look at something as a whole is really difficult. And especially the guitar is a pretty complex system. Um, and it's a complex system in that if you change something somewhere, it does affect almost everything else. Uh, in, so in that way, I, that's why I call it the complex system. It's, and so just have, being uh, trained to think abstractly about abstract objects Helps you helps you understand that it really doesn't. It's not really that bracing that matters, or the fact that the sides are double sides or triple sides or not double at all, or they have bracing or don't have bracing. It's you know you're, you're able to put all of these things into uh, bigger boxes and abstract boxes that kind of interact with each other. Yeah, that's I think that's what the that ability to for abstraction so that. It, to be able to understand the guitar better, that's what comes from math for me. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, let's um let's talk a little bit about your influences. Um, and you've mentioned Jeff Trauget already, and in your email you mentioned Antoine Aubrey, who I don't think I'm familiar with at all. Is he where is he based? Uh, well, he's in Toulouse. Oh, he's okay. He's right above my shop. <laughs> oh, okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's. I mean, if you if you've seen the videos of my instruments, mm -hmm. uh, they all uh, they're shot by him all the photos oh, that okay. are everywhere are made by him <laughs> and uh he's also you know the one playing in the videos oh he's okay a, i didn't realize that was him very cool yeah it's him yeah yeah it, he's a i think he's an incredible guitarist yeah and um 
And so, yeah, I was, I'm very lucky to get to work with him. And he's, he's been influential on my work pretty directly sometimes because he, um, so he would, he would, he, he comes down to the shop every day to say hi. And sometimes he takes pictures and, and we just talk for a while. And he's always, you know, he's going, oh, what are you doing now? And he's looking at what, you know, if I'm working on a rosette, he's like, it's interesting. And, oh, you could do this. And I'll be like, no. And then I'm like, oh, actually, that's interesting. Because <laughs> we've, you know, we've discussed things sometimes when I don't, when I, when I don't know how to deal with it situation like visually sometimes you're like oh, i could do like this or like that and you have you need to pick one um it's good to you know talk with, with others yeah. just to get feedback you don't always follow the feedback but but it helps you understand where you're going mm -hmm. and that's antoine's been very helpful uh for that because we we have similar sensibilities and and uh he has great ideas and I've implemented these ideas a few times and a few times I have, you know, it's just helped me find what I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, even in terms of design, it has nothing to do with the, his ability to be, to play the guitar amazingly. Um, but, um, and of course, in terms of sound, it's always good to have his feedback in terms of playability. Like just, right. You know, if I'm working, I'm shaping a neck, you know, I, I'll try it, but I always, if Antoine is around, I'll be like, here, <laughs> <laughs> tell me what you feel. And then he'll, yeah, I mean, he's a player. He knows. Yeah. Of course, he's not every player, but just between me and him and a couple other guys who work at the shop, he'll get several feedbacks. But getting Antoine's, and he's very, very sensitive. Like his senses are always very um, alert. Mm -hmm. So, he, you know, he's able to feel the neck and be like, oh, there's a little, something here mm. that I, I, you know, I may not have felt or, or I knew about, but, you know, just wanted to make sure that it, it needed to be taken care of. Yeah. So that's Antoine. Uh, yeah. So yeah, the only no, you the only, not the only, but like, I'm hope I'm hoping he will um, become well-known <laughs> eventually because <laughs> I think he's a really, really bright guy, very good guitarist. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, so I think he's working on a couple albums. And EPs oh, very and albums. cool! So hopefully, we'll be able to hear his music on somewhere on platforms and such. Yeah, yeah, for sure, that would be great. Yeah. Um, so going back to Jeff for a second, um, did, yeah. did you ever like worked alongside Jeff, or is, do you just really like his guitars and you've spoken to him about them and gotten his, I guess, his guide feedback? Yeah, we haven't worked together, but he. Um, I got in touch with him to ask if I could use his um, the back brace. You know, the, he makes a brace in the in the middle, going length, um, yeah, longitudinally with the back mm -hmm. that connects all the other braces, and it's kind okay. of floating above the center um, the reinforcement of the back. I, actually, I don't know if he called it the floating brace or somebody. It's so we call it the floating back brace. Okay. It's kind of fits on top of all the other braces. So I asked him about it and he explained to me why he uses it and and how he does it and all that. And then from that email, we started emailing back and forth and eventually it was about other things than guitars, mm -hmm. just our life, you know, our families' lives, et cetera, you know, mm -hmm. became friends. So he's been a, you know, other than being a really good friend, he, uh, a very, very important influence in terms of, uh, what I what I know is possible in terms of sound because when mm -hmm. I hear his guitars I'm like okay so this is possible if this yeah. is possible it's great first I will continue making guitars because this is encouraging to know. <laughs> you know I don't necessarily want to make that sound but but to know that you can make things that make you feel this much just mm -hmm. by listening to it and that's great and uh, he's had a lot of really good advice for you know how to deal with being a guitar maker and in this guitar making, you know, in the guitar world and how interactions are and um, selling and all these things that are not easy for a lot of guitar makers. And every time I followed Jeff's advice, it's been very, very good. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and he encouraged me to do, in to make guitars that, you know, he's had a very long experience repairing guitars mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, doing a lot of neck resets 
and such things. And so he when he builds guitars so they're repairable if needed, but also mm -hmm. hopefully don't really need repair. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, and still sound amazing. So that's all very so he, you know, when he saw I was building in a certain way, he'd always like give me a hard time and tell me you, know, you should really think about it. <laughs> having to do a neck reset because when that guitar comes back in a few years and you have to do a neck reset on it mm -hmm. maybe a little bit <laughs> maybe <laughs> uh, so that's yeah jeff jeff's been very influential and just also just talking to him in general just about the guitar and the guitar role is just um um it's uh, it's soothing in a way and because mm -hmm. he has so much experience and it's yeah. the same for Irvin. they've been around for so long that it's in a way, it's a little demystifying, mm -hmm. and um, there are things that Jeff or Irvin do because you know it's structurally better. Mm -hmm. Like you, you know, when you get into this by yourself, you're like, oh, it's all about sound. It's got to sound this and sound that and be efficient in terms of sounding. And you know, yeah, it has to resist to whatever. But I really care about sound. Well, at least I was like that. But then you're like, but yeah, hold on. But there's why is this done like this? Well, if you don't do it like this, the guitar breaks. Oh, well, that makes sense. Okay. <laughs> but the, you know, the simplicity of looking at things when you have a lot of experience like they do, uh, just makes, just being around that is very, very nice. Yeah. <laughs> it's very, it's, it's soothing in a way and it's um, uh, demystifying. Mm -hmm. And it makes you realize that you do things right and none of this is really a big deal. You yeah. Don't take yourself too seriously. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I feel like I haven't had a ton of uh, experience with Jeff because we don't we've never represented him. But early on, like we had one of his guitars in, and he was one of the first luthiers that I felt like was really accessible. Like you know, even mm -hmm. though we didn't have that official like arrangement or anything like that, like we just had a guitar in on consignment, and and I was like, I have a lot of questions about this, and he just like picked up the phone and called immediately and was just like gave me the yeah. whole rundown, and I was like this is amazing. Like, he's just so like, he's so, you know, open and friendly and, and easy to talk to about everything. And so every time we get a guitar and if his, I'm like, yes, I get to talk to Jeff again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he is. He's very, very, I mean, it's very approachable. Yeah. Yeah. He and, seems like a great yeah, guy. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. So then, um, so what led you to deciding to do the apprenticeship with, Ir with Irvin? Well, you know, I learned guitar making by myself. Mm -hmm. And you know, I was, I don't know, it, it felt good. I was making, I think, good guitars are still good. You know, Antoine's guitar, he's, I still hear it every day and still sounds great. But there's always this part where you're not really sure what you're doing. <laughs> you're not really, you're not confident completely because, you, you know, these guitars you made and the ones you're making most likely are going to be okay and sound good. What you wanted to, take it a certain direction. It's mm -hmm. hard to understand all of this on your own without having a really good sense. And it's not really just understanding because understanding, you can get the understanding from reading and making guitars and reading more. And But it's not having someone next to you, not even telling you because Irvin doesn't <laughs> tell you exactly what to do. He will lead you to understand by ourselves and most of the time, like he likes to think, and I think I, I, I agree with him, is that a lot of the time these things are things you knew, but you just didn't know, you know, you, mm. know, you, you don't think, oh, oh, that's it. You know, is that that's all there is to it? It's impossible. But it is a lot of the time. That's all there is to it. You mm. just have to think in a way that's more simple. And so Irvin is good at that. And he's good at leading you to get to those answers by yourself. I, so I didn't know that at the time before mm -hmm. deciding to go study with him, but I, I felt like I needed to have a better grasp uh, of what what I'm doing so that I can modify it and be very uh, fluid about how I work and where I'm going and what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And and so and it, it did exactly that. And so, I, I yeah, I reached out to Irvin. Yeah, I had a bunch of orders by the time I started the apprenticeship. Still, I, I still decided to go ahead with it and, and do that because it, it felt very important to do. Yeah, just to feel more confident and know what mm -hmm. you're doing. And I gain a sense for all of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's great. 
And and Chris Morimoto, he works with Urban, right? He does, yeah. And so Chris, uh, I think he apprenticed in 2006, and he's been there since. Oh, okay. Wow. So, yeah. So he's been around almost every <laughs> apprentice who went to uh, Urban's shop, and uh, he's incredible. His 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 sense of design is amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, it, you probably haven't seen his work as you can. I mean, you see it on on certain guitars, some of Irvin's mm. guitars sometimes, but it's not. It's a you know, it's Irvin's designs, and then Chris makes them happen. But sometimes you can you can feel that it's somebody's touch. But it that's not really uh, Chris's work. Chris's work is very it's different, and it it's changed over the years. He showed me some of his early work, which I think is great, but he doesn't like it anymore. Mm. Uh, it, what what's amazing in his work is um, it's, it's hard to describe. There's kind of a minimalist approach, but at the same time, it's not because the details are incredible. They're tiny, and they're all there, and they are intricate. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, it can't be minimalist. But mm -hmm. there's the minimalist aspect in that it's not like you know colors that are this and that and like weird things intricate. And what's intricate is you have these tiny shapes they're just like textures and you have something that has no texture next to something that has a texture and suddenly the light behaves differently on them and you see something mm -hmm. uh, yeah like giving an effect with very little mm -hmm. just a change of texture yeah like i was saying this is yeah yeah uh, or change of reflection on something like there will be a face going this way and next to it like just a tiny angle and another part of the piece that's going a different direction and and it would they will reflect light differently oh, yeah that creates a lot of the effect on, on his uh, i'm talking about like you know visual details of course mm -hmm. but and he's been i think i think he's been pretty influential in in other people's work who have, who have worked with him mm -hmm. uh, and some actually give him credit so, which is good yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah so yeah so his work is great and is uh i learned an enormous amount from him. Mm -hmm. um, it it was a lot of technical things, but also, to, of course, there was a lot of technical things because he he is like an encyclopedia of knowledge on mm -hmm. the technical aspect um, of how to build a guitar. But there was a lot also of um, we talked about design. We talked about you know how to deal with certain situations, uh, how to approach the guitar as a whole. Mm -hmm. um that's that's really an important part of the, the apprenticeship is to get to that point where you get that that on that really on it's a sense more than an understanding you just mm -hmm. you, you can you know what you know you know what to do you don't yeah. it's not about the details it's not it's not about like where this brace goes and why is this brace here it's about looking at the whole thing and kind of knowing what to do right um kind of automatically so that's something that actually uh Irvin definitely brought me to that point but chris is is the first one who mentioned that to me because uh, mm -hmm. i was I had so many questions about you know bracing like, like how do you why is this here and what do you do what does what is this one for like what if i made it longer or shorter mm -hmm. I said well it's not really about this it's really about looking look at the top as a whole mm -hmm. and that that started me thinking you know I see. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I definitely owe Chris a lot. And we work together every day and got along and just having someone to work next to and um just talk in general is very is very nice and very helpful. Yeah. Oh, very yeah. cool. Yeah, I feel like there's there's so many things about building the guitar that it would be easy to focus on the like yeah just like why does this one brace go here and why is it exactly this long and like just like yeah. try to like, understand like everything about just that one aspect but it really does i mean it is at the same time kind of an, an organic piece and, and every piece of wood is a little bit different so being able to zoom out and look at it for that sort of greater whole is that's yeah. such a great skill to be able to have and to have somebody who's so good at that must have been really like just like kind of mind expanding <laughs> yeah Mm -hmm. Yeah, and having actually having both um, Chris and Irvin, who both ha have this vision of their the guitar, but they have different approaches. 
mm -hmm. and you know the two different people who think differently about the guitar um mm -hmm. and 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 so just having that was like super helpful because you're getting you're trying to get to go somewhere and you're telling you oh you, here's one way to go here's one way to go and eventually you find your own way mm -hmm. because you see that there are other ways it, nobody's showing you one way to go it's, nobody's right. telling you like this is the only trail that goes up the mountain mm -hmm. but it's more like oh this is the mountain this is the top hey, i go this way and the other yeah. tell you, well, <laughs> i go this way and you're like well okay i feel like going this way but but what matters is where the top is yeah and, it all leads you know, there how how they managed to get up is interesting you know because different ways and then you you find your own um but yeah eventually the result is similar it's like you're at the top and you're looking and you're like first the first thing you think is okay now i know <laughs> and i know that i was wrong about all the questions i had because <laughs> they're not the right <laughs> none of them were the right question but they were important to ask mm -hmm. so the, at, you know at the time they were the right question but in the final um, vision of things, they're they're irrelevant, mm -hmm. um, and I think is um, we we mentioned in in our emails uh, something about bracing, and uh, I think you, you mentioned like how what bracing I use, mm -hmm. and and this is directly related to the apprenticeship and Irvin and Chris is in, and and actually Jeff too in a in a very big way uh, it's that so i don't think anymore of bracing as a i, I like to think of the, the whole thing and i don't think bracing is very relevant in itself mm -hmm. um and, and and actually you know in in practical in, in actuality in, in the practical world it is relevant how you brace a guitar but when you think about it i think it's better to think of it as you know, think of the top as a blank canvas and approach it that way. And, um, you know, what, what I usually do, I use an X brace because the X brace works really well for a lot of things mm -hmm. that I'm trying to do. Uh, so if I'm not trying to do anything different from what I've been doing and or, or if it's different, but the X brace will still work, then I will use the X brace. But other than, than that, everything else is kind of floating, you know. Mm -hmm. I can sometimes I'll use, you know, two X's under the bridge patch. Sometimes I'll use tone bars and uh, really depends on what I'm looking for, how the top behaves and mm -hmm. such things. And, and uh, yeah, so um, it's, I think you can get really great sounding guitars with many different bracing. Yeah. And it's the important part is to know how, you, know, you take the top, you flex it, you can tap it if you want, depending on how you like to work with the top. <clears throat> and that will give you feedback. And from that feedback, you can decide to put braces here or not, and mm -hmm. to shave the braces or not shave them, or, you know, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. And yeah, I like thinking about it like that. And you, you sort of can approach every guitar more individualistically individualistically is that a word um individually <laughs> you can do it and, and think about it more you know for each particular piece of wood or whatever player you're building for i imagine that all kind of factors in yeah it does uh, it does and it, it's um um yeah everything factors in mm -hmm. the, what kind of playing like how how heavy handed the person is or not or how mm -hmm what what they play if they need to be on stage or not all, yeah. all these are directly related to how you work with the mm -hmm. with the top and yeah, the whole sense. guitar yeah yeah awesome well one thing i always like to ask is about your personal tone wood preferences do you do you have any particular favorites or any strong opinions about any strong or controversial opinions about tone woods um I do have a lot of controversial opinions. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I don't know if I should voice them out. I did <laughs> once make the mistake of uh, telling a, um, uh, a person who was a really nice guy, actually. We, we ended up uh, talking more. And then he, 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 we were going to a show. And it, I didn't know him at the time. He was, uh, turns out he's, he was a buyer, um, by potential. He was going to the show as a visitor. That's what I mean. Mm -hmm. and, he was collecting a guitar by a really great maker with a tone wood that I 
wasn't really impressed with and that somehow we ended up being i didn't know about any of this beforehand we were having breakfast and you know with the other guitar makers and he was there and other visitors you know to the show and i don't know why i said oh well, yeah but you know this tone would and, and blah 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 and it's it's nothing and it doesn't sound like that. <laughs> i don't know why i said these things because it's actually not none of the stuff that i really believe anymore now but at yeah. the time i would i did and and he was like oh well i'm it's really I'm, you know, I'm, I'm sad that you just said that because I'm going to collect that guitar at the show from like this amazing <laughs> maker. And because of that tone, you know, it's, it's it was very special to me. I was like, I shouldn't have said that. Um, and it turns out, you know, obviously it's not really true because but where I, it's hard to think about tone wood exactly because every maker, the influence of tone wood in their guitars is different. Mm -hmm. uh, how much it plays into the I'm talking about back and sides when I say tone wood because the top is a very the whole different thing but mm -hmm. for back and side uh, for some uh, the, okay from what I know now which may change with the years as I play more uh, my peers guitars but my experience now has showed me that um, the, the influence on your sound is different so for my guitars, I know what influence it has, and it's it's not a huge influence, but it's there. There's some color. There's some, um, you know, in the resonance, how much you, resonance you get with the guitar. It may be easier to get a lot of it with some tone woods, and you know, if you want something that sounds like a cathedral, and you go with rosewood, it's probably easier to get than going with maple. Mm -hmm. Not to say that it's impossible, but just to say that it, some tone woods make it easier to get certain colors yeah <clears throat> that's that's all i can say really that's what i can say about my guitars and but i've heard maple guitars that sounded you know if you didn't know it was maple you would say oh this is rosewood so it's yeah. the people what people think about you know of rosewood as producing this sound yeah uh, it's almost the the red and white problem where if you if you, if you don't know what you're yeah. looking at and what you're tasting you might be like oh that one tastes like a red but it's actually a rosé <laughs> exactly it could be either it could even be white and if, if if you taste a warm white wine you could think it's a red yeah if it has enough tannins you know, dig dark it has a little tannin from the wood or something yeah anyway details <laughs> but so I do have controversial things to say. But actually, I, there's um, something I will not name a lot. I like his work a lot, and he's a really nice guy. Uh, he said something about the tone wood on an interview. And I heard that, and I was like, this is exactly the opposite of what I think about that tone wood. There's <laughs> something about um, a, a kind of rosewood that sounded very kind of you know, slow to him, it was like slow to react and because it's heavy. And all. Mm -hmm. so that's interesting because to me, when I use that on my guitars, I feel like, you know, what it adds is something more snappy. Mm. It's, like it's very, I feel like it's very quick. Mm -hmm. But then I thought about it, it's like, okay, so he's probably right. And I'm right because, you know, what I hear is what I hear. What he hears is what he hears. Yeah. And I trust his judgment. So we, you know, so it's, is it possible that we're both right? And I'm like, yeah, it's totally possible that we're both right. It's in, all you need to do is build the guitar differently and treat that area of the guitar differently. Like in the thickness or rigidity or whatever, the way you brace it can make the same wood because it does, that wood has those two particularities. It can, when you work it in a certain way, it can be very, be very quick and very efficient at transporting sound, but it's also a very heavy wood. So it's, if you're trying to drive it, well, it's a lot of mass to drive. So it could be very slow. Mm -hmm. It could definitely be both. It really depends mm. on how, what you do with it. And that was a very good learning experience. So listening to that, really, I don't agree. And then we're like, okay, now I do agree. And there's <laughs> probably a reason why we disagree. We originally disagreed on this. We're both right. That doesn't answer the question of what tone would I prefer. <laughs> yeah. So for, um, for your guitars, do you have, like, what, what is what are your, like, top three tone woods, back and side woods? Rosewood in general, but mostly Indian rosewood and Brazilian rosewood. Mm -hmm. uh, those because they're so versatile and because Brazilian rosewood smells so good when you work <laughs> with it that it's it's like it's 
yeah, it's hypnotizing. It's really mm -hmm. incredible. Um, and you know, it smells really good. But um, yeah, because they're they're very very versatile. Yeah, I would say that's that's mm -hmm. really what I like about them. And they they will give you immediate access to a lot of sound yeah you know, a lot of different different sounds and and i really love ebony actually mm -hmm. and there's something you, you know if i'm trying to get a chocolatey sound out of rosewood it's possible but i feel like it's a little easier when i make a guitar out of ebony mm -hmm. i need that <clears throat> slightly slower reaction that mm -hmm. i get at least on my guitars so if somebody tells you on my guitars ebony sounds snappy you know i believe them but on mine there's that you know, it's kind of slower attack. Mm -hmm. um, there's, there's something that softens the attack that that sounds really nice to me, and it's, that's a, that's a sound I really love. And yeah. I, I don't know if it matters if the uh, I've only used the striped ebony so far, you know, and maybe the the white parts because they're a little softer. They, they maybe they play a role. Oh, in yeah. them. Other woods are really um, I haven't tried yet. But I really really want to get into our um a lot of the local woods we have in europe mm -hmm. uh, not all of them I, there are some i don't like i don't really like walnut mm -hmm. uh, i've made several guitars out of walnut and, and i'm not a fan personally but that's just me i know some a lot of builders make really great guitars with walnut um <clears throat> but uh fruit woods i have uh, i have several sets of uh, apple and pear and uh, this something's very appealing about it mm. i want to i want to try them so hopefully I'll get I'll get to do that in the next uh, year or two. So if I were to make myself a guitar, I think it would be most likely an OM and European spruce top because that's that's mostly what I do. So I'll do European spruce, and mm -hmm. also being in Europe, it's, it makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> um, and either ebony or Indian rosewood. Actually, I love wenge. Wenge is really, really nice wood. I love the look. I love the mm -hmm. sound I get on my guitars. It's a very good alternative to a lot of things. Yeah. Um, yeah. Maybe wenge or apple or olive. I have a few, few sets of olive since, since I was born in Syria mm -hmm. and been surrounded by olive trees. Mm -hmm. I feel like using olive wood makes sense. <laughs> yeah. It's beautiful wood. That'd be cool. <clears throat> awesome. Well, yeah. I don't want to take up too much more of your time because I feel like we've already been having such a long chat. So I'll just ask a few. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, yeah. Last... No, no. I, I few yeah. rapid fire last questions. Um, what do you What do you like to listen to while you're working? Do you have any podcasts or albums that you're really into right now? I I do listen to podcasts. I listen to interviews like your podcast, uh, Michael Bashkin's podcast, mm -hmm. and uh, Number File podcast, which is a math podcast. That's uh, oh, cool. Really fun to listen to for me. <laughs> yeah uh and in terms of music I, it's like a little bit of everything it's not all, it, it, sometimes guitar music but most of the time it's other things um really you know periods of time where i listen to yeah um i found that some, when i need to focus sometimes um like heavy metal will be helpful because <laughs> if you if you if your if your brain tends to go into different directions um heavy metal will take it's so like complex music and it's so like you know it needs a lot of attention so you most of your brain will go there and then you whatever's left can focus on the task so that's fun <laughs> to listen to. Huh. but i listen to other things like sometimes it'll be all sorts hip-hop classical music and you know um blues mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> thank you so much for for taking the time to chat with me today this has been so nice to get to know you better and um and yeah, we're really excited to Thank showcase you. the moon trout on on Carter Vintage Exchange. And yeah, is there anything else that you wanted to promote while we while, while I have you on here? Um, no, that's uh, that's that's it. Thank you so much for taking the time. And um, yeah, I hope uh, I hope it was satisfactory. <laughs> Everything we talked about, I talked a lot, so it could be we'll probably have to edit it out. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mind. <laughs> Thanks so much for listening to this episode of Talking Guitar. 
Michelle has listed his Moon Trout Mod D on the Carter Vintage Exchange, heard here. If you want to learn more, visit the link in the show notes. I've got more chats in the pipeline with folks like John Slobot of Circa, Jake Minier of JKM Guitars, JC Baxendale, and plenty more, so be sure to check back next week for the latest episode. Thank you.